Okay, now let's very briefly, since we understand something with regards to the immigrant experience, and primarily with regards to the Mexican experience and its impact on the Chicano communities as part of Chicano studies, we want to also understand something about how Muslims uh, fit into this equation. Because after all, um, Muslims and immigration uh, uh, go hand in glove too. So let's, uh, uh, let's share, uh, what I want to do is share with you a few facts about the Muslim community and then I want to go over the importance of one of the, uh, the importance of a, uh, of a Muslim, of, of Muhammad Ali, and what he means to the faith. Now, American Muslims come from various backgrounds and are one of the most racially diverse religious groups in the United States. What is not readily known to most Americans is that native-born American Muslims are mainly African Americans who make up a quarter of the total Muslim population. Many converted to Islam during the last 70 years. Now, according to the Pew Research Center, the U.S. Muslim community is made up heavily of immigrants and the children of immigrants from around the world. Nearly 6 in 10, according to their report, nearly 6 in 10 U.S. Muslim adults, that's 58%, are first-generation Americans having been born in another country. An additional 18% are second-generation Americans, people who were born in the U.S. who have at least one parent who was an immigrant. About a quarter, 24% of U.S. Muslims, are U.S. natives with U.S.-born parents. Basically, they are from families who have been in the United States three generations or longer, which is the case for nearly three-quarters of U.S. adults overall, 73%. Now, <clears throat> no racial or ethnic group makes up a majority of Muslim American adults. A plurality of Muslims are white, 41%. This is a category that includes those who describe their race as Arab, Middle Eastern, Persian, Iranian, or in a variety of other ways. Okay? Uh, these are all related to white classification, right, white racial classifications. About 3 in 10 are Asian, 28%, including those from South Asia, and one-fifth are black, 20%. Fewer are Hispanic, 8%, and an additional 3% identify with another race or multiple races. So Muslim immigrants are much more likely than U.S.-born Muslims to describe their race as Asian, 41%, versus 10%. And U.S.-born Muslims are more likely than immigrant Muslims to be black, 32% versus 11%. In fact, fully half of Muslims whose families have been in the U.S. for a three, at least three generations are black. But let's go to a commemoration of Muhammad Ali. The death of my hero, your hero, Muhammad Ali, has rightly dominated global news headlines. Tributes have poured in from presidents, sports stars, and celebrities worldwide. Liberals and conservatives alike have lined up to sing his praises. Call me a cynic, but sorry, I can't believe that all of it is truly heartfelt and genuine. Think about it. If a top black athlete today converted to Islam and then declared that he wouldn't, quote, help murder and burn another poor nation simply to continue the domination of white slave masters because his real enemy was at home, he would be denounced as a traitor, as anti-American. If that top black athlete today called for reparations, saying the US government should admit its guilt over slavery and take $25 billion from its defense budget to build houses for black Americans, he'd be dismissed as a divisive crackpot. If that top black athlete today declared his, quote, support for the Palestinian struggle to liberate their homeland and oust the Zionist invaders, he'd annoy a lot of top politicians and might even be labeled an anti-Semite. But those are the exact things that Ali did say. And remember, back when he was saying this stuff, he was reviled too. He was attacked and demonized. Millions hated Ali. Top sports writers called him a punk and the white man's burden. The NSA tapped his phone. Yet today he's lauded by the same types of people who slammed him in the 60s and 70s. Today he's praised by political and media elites 
for supposedly transcending race and religion. As one commentator pointed out, throughout US history, white Americans have toned down the life stories of radical people of color so that they can celebrate them as they want them to be, not as they were. But the inconvenient truth for establishment types now jumping on the Ali bandwagon is that he was a radical, a revolutionary, a proud black Muslim American who railed against both domestic racism and foreign wars. And look, I'm not saying it's not a good thing that so many powerful people have either changed their views on Ali and what he stood for or pretended not to notice what he stood for. Nor am I saying they're all hypocrites. No, all I want is a little more consistency and a little less whitewashing of history. Let me finish with a line from the poet Maya Angelou, who once said, people will forget what you did, but people will never forget how you made them feel. Muhammad Ali made millions of us feel proud of our identity, our ethnicity, our political views, our religious beliefs, and we will never forget him. Rest in peace, my brother. Rest in peace. I am the greatest. As we have learned in this course, the fear of the other, the fear of the not me, that stranger at the gate, has haunted the American and has led to a national character known as nativism. And since 9-11, the nativism expressed towards the immigrant in general, and the Mexican in specific, is now accompanied by a new hysteria, Islamophobia. Now, the American public identifies this as an intense fear or hatred of or prejudice against the Islam religion or Muslims, especially when seen as a geopolitical force for the source of terrorism. So, of course... As we have learned in this course, Americans can't tell the difference between any of the beans that I introduced you to, much less the diversity expressed in each of the bean types. Let's listen to Professor Nazia Kazi explain to us her experiences in higher education teaching against Islamophobia in the age of terror. So in this, we go to film clip 11 and listen to Professor Nazia Kazi. As an educator and someone who spends a lot of time in the university classroom, um, I get to see firsthand the ways in which a lot of our young people understand um, terror. You know, most of them have grown up in the so-called terror age, post 9-11. And the bad guys, uh, to put it so simply, have been Osama bin Laden, ISIS, Saddam Hussein, and Al-Qaeda. And there's very little nuance, quite often, in their understanding of these global realities. Uh, one of the things I find in the uni university classroom, and I talk about in this piece, is the really puzzling coexistence of a deep hawkishness and a systemic ignorance. So on the one hand, um, students will have very strong opinions about what the U.S. needs to do globally, but actually have very little knowledge about the histories of, say, Muslim-majority countries. And I take very seriously the fact that these things coexist. Um, I think that the war against terrorism, the U.S. war on terror, would not have been possible without a deep public anti-intellectualism. In other words, there's kind of a systemic ignorance that the war on terror needs, it requires, in order to operate. Um, many of my students have been fed these binaries about the free world and the unfree world, you know, peace-loving people and terrorists, and have accepted these binaries wholesale. And the job for us as educators is to really, what I argue, is to insert critical thinking as a terrorism prevention tool. Um, you know, a way of thinking past these simplistic binaries and thinking geopolitically, historically, and contextually, uh, making connections between U.S. racism domestically and imperialism abroad. As we have seen, and what we've understood with regards to the overall uh, Mexican and the overall Latin, Latin American experience here in the United States, um, as we have understood certain things about um, neoliberalism and immigration. And as you have gone through the readings, uh, hopefully you have done your book review by now, or you're understanding and you're reading the books that have been assigned for this course, that you're recognizing the significance of uh, the economy. And what we need to appreciate is that um, unemployment has nothing to do with immigration. Uh, immigration restriction legislation is but a common response to continuing patterns of labor force needs 
and economic cycles, foreign policy wars, and racism. So, <coughs> excuse me, what you have learned in this class is that the community has been very important as a political force. And the community has to be reckoned with. With regards to the Chicano movement, with regards to the civil rights movement. And so when we take a look at the economy, jobs have, do not have a national identity. Just take a look at this border. There's many factors that affect the unemployment rates. And since the 1980s, and since the Ronald Reagan administration, and since neoliberalism has occurred, deregulation and deindustrialization is the norm. There's been a decline in federal social spending. There's been a rise in plant closures and outsourcing. And so there's all these structural changes that have occurred. High paying manufacturing and government jobs have evaporated. Meanwhile, service sector jobs have been created. So there's an industrial revolution, a new industrial revolution going on, but not here in this country. Now, back then, when we covered the 1880s or at the turn of the 20th century, uh, the Industrial Revolution brought workers to the factory. So we got to see how the United States brought workers all over from throughout the world. There, since World War II, there's been a post-industrial revolution where industries and workers now have been relocated. There's a new international division of labor that has been going on where labor-intensive portions of operations have moved out of the United States. Now, it started in the 1880s, where New England's factories moved to the South to take advantage of poor, widowed white women. Uh, then, in the 1940s, it moved to Puerto Rico, which became known as Operation Bootstrap. And then, in the 1960s, it moved to Mexico, which was known as the Border Industrialization Program that has brought us the Maquilas, in the 1970s, it moved to the Caribbean and Haiti, um, primarily, and, and, and uh, the, um, in the 1980s in, in um, Santo Domingo, or uh, the Dominican Republic. And then in the 1990s, it moved to Central and South America. Now, at the turn of the century, it's moving to Asia, India, Taiwan. So you move jobs across borders, you move jobs across oceans, and why? Well, the idea was to avoid labor unions. The idea was to avoid workers who are organizing to try to raise their level of subsistence, to get a decent wage so that they can live comfortably. And the idea was also to, to avoid the rich labor laws that have resulted uh, as, a, as a result of the United States of people's uh, fighting for their civil rights, and most importantly, the environment, because we have a strong environmental movement that started in the 1970s and challenged corporations to, you know, what are you doing to communities? What's happening with communities? You can't just go dump battery acid in a stream. You can't do your number anywhere in a pond. And so the environmental laws are very important uh, here in the United States, and corporations want to avoid that. So what's happening is that you have outsourcing. So let's go to um, film clip number 12, and let's appreciate how unemployment has nothing to do with immigration, how unemployment has everything to do with outsourcing. In one of America's most economically depressed cities resides the world's largest producer of home appliances. Whirlpool Corporation is headquartered in Benton Harbor, Michigan, where 60% are unemployed, 90% live in poverty, and per capita income is roughly $10,000. The citizens of Benton Harbor are living from one day to the next. They're very poor, and they're very disheartened. I mean, there's been very little effort on the part of Whirlpool that runs everything to try to um, involve the community. In 2009, Whirlpool received a $19.3 million grant from the federal government, in part, to create jobs. I think our U.S. workforce, uh, certainly uh, factory workforce, if you will, is, is, is the best among the world. So we are very confident 
in the future of U.S. manufacturing for our kind of products. One year later, the corporation received nearly $20 million from the state of Michigan to expand its facility, which now serves as a gateway into Benton Harbor. It's good for the community, good for the state, and good for your business as well. I'll tell you, there's a real art to that. But as the U.S.-based corporation has grown globally, more jobs have been outsourced to countries demanding less wages. Today, the former blue-collar community of Benton Harbor remains a victim of America's deindustrialization and growing poor population. Whirlpool has 71,000 employees around the globe, but no longer manufactures home products in its hometown. It still remains a recipient of U.S. state and federal stimulus funding. Whirlpool just closed the factory, and that hurt my business, my little business. I lost a lot of clients. This is their home base, and it always has been. And in the beginning of the large development, they promised us that they would always be. Due to the recession, the corporate behemoth of home appliances hasn't paid U.S. income tax since 2008. By 2010, nearly 99% of Benton Harbor residents were receiving food stamps, while Whirlpool banked approximately $18 billion in annual sales. I think I've purchased my last Whirlpool appliance. I don't even think I'll call for a repair because too often and for too long, those that have gotten rich has forgotten who's helped them to get there and they're willing to step on us. And that just doesn't sit well with my soul. A soul living in one of America's poorest cities, clothed in poverty and accessorized in corporate success. Marina Portnaya, RT, New York. Now, one of the things that we uh, are learning uh, since the 1980s is this notion of neoliberalism in the Washington Consensus, which is known as uh, deregulation, okay? uh, deindustrialization. There's been a wholesale move in search of lower wages. There's been a wholesale move in search of the most docile unions. There's been a wholesale move in terms of finding the least regulation. So whenever you see workers in a host country get the jobs that used to be in the United States, well, of course, they benefit from job creation. But also it's done at the expense of their rights. And if they try to organize into unions, if they challenge the system, then the companies just move to find another country that will give them the profits they so desire. Wall Street does this. So when you take a look at Maquiladoras, Maquilas, right here on the border, on the U.S.-Mexico border, uh, this is where United States corporations outsource their most labor-intensive work. And of course, Mexico tries to provide them a business-friendly environment to attract and preserve what are scarce jobs. But you see, that competition that's, that's, that's been happening in the third world, that competition, well, it's now in the United States. Just take a look at your neighborhoods. Just take a look and see what's happening to your neighborhoods. Because the high-profit, cheap product model is here on every corner. That's right. Malwar, your source of cheap plastic crap, is right around your corner. And the idea is to exploit the global inequalities. And these have been uh, moving workers and moving production around the world. And this is what's going on. And so when we take a look at the free trade agreements, uh, the free trade agreements that have been uh, offered, NAFTA, uh, the Central American Free Trade Agreement, CAFTA, um, these free trade agreements are unsustainable. Uh, they're both morally and politically. Um, with population growth, well, we need more jobs. But the kinds of jobs that we need aren't international jobs. We need local, local jobs, community jobs. See, many jobs today produce goods and services, but these goods and services are consumed elsewhere. They're not consumed within the community. And this is the difference between global markets versus local production. So there's many themes and patterns uh, that occurred in the 20th century that are significant for us to this day. And we need to appreciate and understand these themes and patterns. 
And so, of course, the most important is the immigration restriction legislation. And as I shared with you, these cycles of change are very important. Some of you uh, performed an essay trying to address the cycles of change. That whenever there are economic labor necessities, the remedy becomes Mexican migration, which stimulates a movement of people into the United States for work. When the work is satisfied, there oftentimes occurs an economic downturn, which results in immigration restriction legislation and deportation. Okay? So this is the cycle. You bring in workers, you don't need them, send them back. And why Mexico is so convenient is because, well, there's the border there, you just send them back. The, so the idea is that you, 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 know, you, 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 you uh, what, what, how, how did I phrase it in a previous, uh, Mexicans, you can't live with them, you can't live without them. Uh, that's the American way. Okay, and even though we are in Mexico, because this is the city, Nuestra Señora, cerca del Rio Porciunco, La Reina Los Angeles, um, but nonetheless, again, uh, the immigration restriction legislation is but a common response to labor force needs and economic cycles. And so when we take a look at resistance movements, when we take a look at foreign policy wars, when we take a look at racism, uh, we need to appreciate how all of that is bringing people into the United States from Central America, now from the Middle East, from, from, from Africa and from Asia. Um, the United States and its foreign policy is causing many peoples to come to the United States seeking asylum, seeking refuge, because the United States is busy bombing their countries. And uh, most recently, now there's a controversy uh, because um, uh, Donald Trump just recently called African nations, you know, uh, shithole nations. Um, so there's, there is this controversy that's occurring. When we take a look at, uh, at the increase in population by both uh, immigration and then, of course, for the Mexican, the increase in population uh, in the Latin American and the natural increase, it's at a record pace. So what's happening in these communities here in Los Angeles, in Chicago, in New York, in Miami, in Austin, Texas, in Denver, in El Paso? In Phoenix, there is a, a plural disposition of language, a plural disposition of culture, a plural disposition of identity continues. The importance of community, though, as a political force continues. And the increase in population by both immigration and natural increase is at a record pace. So we need to appreciate something about the Chicano movement because the Chicano movement is at the forefront of addressing uh, immigration reform. The Chicano movement is right there uh, involved in uh, 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 addressing the issues of the community because the Chicano movement is about civil rights. And this is why we have courses like this in the Chicano, History, in the Chicano Studies uh, Department here at Cal State Dominguez Hills. The movement is constantly being redefined as a configuration of political intersections, as a configuration of linguistic intersections, of cultural intersections, of economic intersections. And so the Chicano movement and Chicano studies demands a continuous appraisal, especially as the ongoing process of globalization and the relocation of peoples and cultures characterizes the experience. So let's take a look at contemporary resistance movements within the Chicano community to understand this phenomenon. When a farm worker calls with an issue or a problem, we stop because this is farm worker centered. When we say food sovereignty and food justice, it comes from right from that very core of the people working the land and from the land. And I am going into the fields as a farm worker and I will become the farm worker and I will see what is possible or not. And I will be with them. And that's the way it is. Once I'm there, it's what I am. I really believe in the family farming system 
And I have friends that are not Latinos, that are not Mexicans, that are struggling to keep their family farms. And I believe we have to have that. We have to support that as farm workers. That's our part of our liberation is to have a system that that doesn't treat us like machines or animals. Valdemar Velasquez, president of the Farm Labor Organizing Committee, Central Labor Council, Toledo, Ohio. Ohio Executive Board Member of the uh, Ohio AFL-CIO. Brothers and sisters, I want to speak specifically to the legalization aspect of this resolution. The first, which has been spoken about already now, is the issue of compliance. We have, if we are in a nation of laws, we have to give people a way in which they can comply with the law. And I got to remind you that crossing the border without papers is a misdemeanor. It is not a felony. It's like you running a red light or running a stop sign, okay? But you got the ability to make that right. America, this is a law that, that gets broken that we have no way to make it right. We have to have a way for workers to comply and get everybody in compliance, including employers. Remember, for every undocumented worker in this country, there's an undocumented employer taking advantage of those people. <laughs> Secondly, I want to address the attacks that we're going to get as a labor movement from these talking heads on radio and TV. They're going to say, there's those labor guys again. They're, all they're doing is doing this amnesty. I say to them, so what? Amnesty is an American tradition and an American principle that's embedded in our institutions in this country. See, they don't call it amnesty. They give it another name, like in our system of jurisprudence, right? They call it plea bargaining, right? You cop to a higher crime and you get forgiven for that, you get an amnesty for that, cop to a lesser crime. You know, it goes all the way to the president of the United States. They don't call it amnesty there. They call them presidential pardons, right? These guys break the law, they get forgiven. Okay, so they got uh, something that they didn't deserve, right? Going with one of the most famous ones is Scooter Libby. Remember that guy? And remember his buddy in the White House who deferred his prison sentence? He got amnesty. I'd like to see him on Lou Dobbs and ask him what he thinks about amnesty. The third is what has been spoken here, and that's the issue of moral imperative. My brother and sister, with all respect to the religions of the world, my Judeo-Christian heritage tells me the following. In the Old Testament, Ezekiel 22, or not Ezekiel, uh, Exodus 22 warns us not to mistreat or oppress the alien. The book of Numbers chapter 15, verse 15 says that we shall govern the alien with the same laws as we govern ourselves. So let's get right with God, because if you don't, Ezekiel, Ezekiel 22, 29 and 30 warns that he's going to be really ticked off if we do these things to these aliens. <laughs> Finally, in the New Testament, those of us who call ourselves Christians, we are recipients of the greatest amnesty in the world. Didn't Jesus come and take all our sins, everything we ever done wrong, all the laws we ever broke, took them to the cross and say, you're forgiven? And who are we to deny them to anybody else? And finally, my brothers and sisters, let us be like the founders of the great unions in this hall. They were all immigrants. Many of them came here without papers. So they start organizing the people, and now immigrants are joining unions at the greatest rate of any segment of the population. I'd say, let's be like the founders of your unions who came to this country and organized unions. They didn't say, they didn't say what country you are from. They only said, which side are you on? I'm going to be on your side. Queremos que los consumidores sepan que el tomate que ellos consumen son basados en la explotación de los trabajadores agrícolas. Los supermercados básicamente compran tomate en las compañías donde trabajamos. Ellos empujan a las compañías a bajar el precio más barato del mercado. Y eso lo obliga al trabajador de no tener un aumento. La cubeta pesa 32 libras. Por 32 libras nosotros ganamos 45 centavos. Y el precio de la cubeta nunca ha aumentado por hace 30 años. Papá, 
En el trabajo que hacemos nosotros no tenemos derechos. En los casos más extremos, trabajadores se enfrentan esclavitud moderna. Los supermercados tienen una influencia bastante grande. Por eso la coalición de trabajadores de Imocali está llevando una campaña por comida justa. Lo que estamos queriendo es un centavo más por cada libre tomate. Join with the coalition of Imocali workers to help make fair food a reality. Take action at ciw-online.org. Some members of the Latino community are calling today's ruling vindication for what they called years of racially motivated and anti-immigrant policies enforced by Arpaio. Team 12's Kevin Kennedy is in the Live Alert Center with more of their reaction tonight. Kev? Yeah, they are calling it a good day, but they are certainly not satisfied. Latino leaders want to see Arpaio in jail for his crime and hope his conviction sends a strong message to law enforcement all across the country. It's a day 24 years in the making. I was very shocked. I, I couldn't believe it that that a judge had finally realized all the damage that he's caused to so many families. The migrant justice organization Puente Movement reacting after a judge finds former sheriff Joe Arpaio guilty of criminal contempt. I believe it's time he gets a taste of his own medicine. Wearing Stop Arpaio and Arrest Arpaio shirts, members celebrate the ruling. Many of our members here at Puente um, were targeted because of his racist practices. One of those arrested Noemi Romero during a work raid in 2013. I think it was just him taking advantage of the power that he had and just thinking he could go out of his ways and arrest all kinds of people. A judge in some ways validating what many have long believed, while others are demanding much more from the new sheriff. One step closer to finding justice for our communities, Penzone has to carry out the rest. Puente wants all ICE officers out of the 4th Avenue jail, determined to end what the group calls the history of racism. Most of the members I spoke with say no amount of jail time is sufficient when compared to the pain and suffering our power caused so many in the Latino community for so many years. Kevin Kennedy, 12 News. All right, Kev, thanks. Mi nombre es Oscar Sánchez. Uh, de trabajar en Vermont Carlos ya tengo uh, cinco años. Antes nos enfermamos, teníamos que trabajar así como estuviéramos enfermos. Y ahora, pues, gracias a Dios, mi vida cambió. Porque si yo me siento mal, Yo tengo una clínica donde ir. Y eso es gracias a la campaña de Clinical. The working conditions are extremely arduous and difficult. And many car wash workers have chronic diseases or have environmental health conditions that are the result of their work the car wash workers were beginning to organize and I was actually very uh, excited and moralized to hear that it was the steel workers that were leading that. What we saw was this was an opportunity for St. John's to support the organizing effort so that they know that if they join the clean car wash campaign they'll have access to free medical and dental and mental health services. We feel very strongly that this is a model um, that we can support which is be the health care provider uh, as part of an organizing drive so that, that, the, that workers understand what it is that they're building. One of the great things about the car wash model is that it's rooted in the people and where they want to go and what they want to do. The goal is how do we build power for workers so that they can make and implement the change they want to see. Pues ahora me siento orgulloso de haber conocido la, la campaña de United Street Workers y mi orgullo para mí es a, que ya tengo un mes que ganamos un sindicato, tenemos un mes de estar ya apoyando, apoyados con la campaña de, de Clean Carlos. The role of labor unions and community-based organizations becomes ever more important because this is about values and it's about what we want this country to be. 
And I think these new alliances and new ways of doing things and these value-based coalitions and relationships and organizing strategies are what's needed to reinvigorate the labor movement. The labor community partnerships that are happening on the ground between worker centers is really where I see a lot of hope. I see a lot of deep trust and relationship growing and developing and a lot of potential for movements that we need to address the very, very serious conditions that we're in. De darle ánimo a otros compañeros, decirles ir a donde ellos trabajan y decirles que, que luchen como nosotros luchamos y esa es la oferta de la campaña porque la campaña los va a apoyar, los va a apoyar también. Que nosotros vamos para adelante con apoyar a otros compañeros para vencer a cualquier patrón aquí en California. So, let me just share with you now that Chicano, whereas I uh, uh, attempted to share with you that any time an immigrant comes into the United States, uh, what, what does it mean to be Chicano as, as far as a Mexican coming into the U.S.? Well, they face the four-part process of the racialization uh, experience. All right? That's what it means to be Chicano, is that you're going to face that four-part process because there's the prejudice against you as a Mexican. All right? So again, when I take a look at the Chicano experience, it's not just a Mexican experience anymore. You know? What does it mean to be Chicano? Well, to be Chicano in the 20th century was that you faced the four-part process of, uh, 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 that, would, that resulted from the racialization process. Remember, there was, there, was, uh, there was the prejudice, the discrimination, the segregation, and then the four-part process that people faced. Economic marginality, political disfranchisement, social racial discrimination, educational deprivation. And so what Chicano meant was that you address those issues in terms of resistance. Resistance and affirmation, that was, that was the, the key. Chicano was a term of affirmation. Chicano, Chicana. Now, when we take a look at Chicano, Chicana, it's not just a Mexican experience anymore because all Latin Americans, Caribbean, Central, South American, are involved in the struggle now. Uh, Chicano, Chicana is, is an African, a Native American, a mixed-blooded affair, it is now also Muslims are experiencing what it means to be Chicano Chicana. And of course, this is a, 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 a mixed blooded affair that's incorporating the labor forces that have been conjured up by NAFTA and CAFTA and anything else thereafter. And so it is with this that I want to conclude the course with two film clips. The first one is an international movement of musicians that are attempting to find peace. And so we're going to go to um, a song uh, by the great Bob Marley, but it is done by musicians um, worldwide that are attempting to share how the, through globally we can become part of the human experience. We are all human beings. So I want to end this course with one song about our humanity According to our philosophy, music has been a great power, power to, to bring peace and to get enlightenment because it is sort of meditation, because you need a lot of, lot of dedication in order to bring the music a great art. When there is a great art, there is always heaven. That is why we believe that through music, if you practice a lot, you meditate on it, you, you uh, feel nothing else than peace. So we believe that through music we can get enlightenment. Okay, so um, we only played a, a few minutes of that one love. You could go, I, I provide the link on Blackboard for you so that you can see the entire production simply because of copyright laws. We can't play the entire uh, um, 
the entire clip. But nonetheless, hopefully you'll be looking at Playing for Change and join Playing for Change. I encourage you. Uh, it is a very important movement. Um, then uh, I want to finally end with a, a, a song uh, by Ricardo Arjona, who is a Guatemalan. Uh, he's a musician. Uh, throughout his work, he's always honored the undocumented here in the United States. And he came out with a song a while back. Um, and, and through this song, he argued for immigrant rights. And he called this song Mojado. And in this song Mojado, it is his contribution to, the, to raise the consciousness of Latin American community and to what they face as they come to the United States to work. And so um, we're going to, again, we're going to end this class with another film clip uh, very briefly on Ricardo Arjona's song Mojado, and you'll just see a, a few seconds of it, uh, and then I will provide the link so that you can watch the enti in its entirety. And I chose this particular song because it ends the course in an appropriate manner where what we have been learning about uh, uh, the, the immigrant experience and the Mexican identities, uh, the Latino identities, um, this, is, this is so crucial uh, to uh, our appreciation of what, what Latinos and Mexicanos have contributed to the United States. And this is appropriate to end.